Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Motion Lewis. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. I am ecstatic and delighted to be joined nonetheless by Gerald Albright. His reputation precedes himself. Over three decades in the industry, um, bass player, sax player, eight Grammy nominations, and you literally will hear his music everywhere. Right now, he's at the top of the Billboard charts, and I am so delighted to have you join us, Mr. Albright. It's good to be here. Thanks for the invite. Great to see you. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to just sort of roll back the clock a bit and just take that stroll down memory lane and, and really just talk about how you essentially, if I am not mistaken, started playing the bass at first. Well, actually, I started playing piano uh -huh. at the oh. age of seven or eight years old okay. and um, didn't like piano at the time. It was something okay. that was kind of a uh, prerequisite for my parents to, to do with their kids, you know, start them on piano lessons. And so my brother actually went a lot farther with piano than I did. Uh, but I just didn't like practicing C scales and, and all the stuff, you know, to, to be, be ready for the, uh, the following lesson. And it just didn't talk, it didn't speak to me. So after two or three lessons, uh, my uh, private teacher, uh, God rest his soul, uh, George Turpo, had a talk with my parents and said, hey, look, Gerald's not feeling this piano. We gotta, we gotta change this. And he happened to have an old saxophone in his garage that he used to play in the army. Mm. And he decided along with my parents that uh, unannounced, they would bring that to the next lesson. And uh, so he came the following week with this, this historical saxophone that was in this old molded case. And uh, uh, long story short, he opened the case up and he said, hey, lick this reed, get it nice and moist. I'm like, okay. You know, what are we doing today? He says, we're doing something different. And uh, so I put the reed on the mouthpiece and the ligature on the mouthpiece. And mm -hmm. uh, he showed me how to blow a note and it turned out to be a squeak. And I've been squeaking for decades now. So, <laughs> so I owe that turn in, in, in my interest in music to George Turpo, for mm -hmm. sure. Right. And what do you think sort of helped to fuel the passion? Because like you were sort of describing, it wasn't like uh, completely something uh, intuitive in first uh, that you had been hearing lots of sax players might be the typical or might have gone to a, to a lounge or your parents were playing it. What do you think sort of helped to um, fit with you and your personality? Well, uh, to answer that question, uh, I have to mention another gentleman. His name is Maceo Parker. Yeah. Uh, from the James Brown band. My brother, who's eight years my senior, virtually had every James Brown record that he had recorded at the time in his uh, collection. And so between that and gospel music, that's what I heard in the house every day. Okay. And every now and then I would hear James Brown call out Maceo. Yes. And Maceo would do this incredible percussive solo with this clear sound on alto sax. And it just caught my ear. I was like, wow, that's 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 the way I want to sound. And so he was my initial mentor. Now, ironically, years later, we're, we're dear friends. And whenever I tell him that, you know, he was my very first mentor, you know, he, he just kind of blows it off. And says, I'm like, no, Maceo, you don't understand. You are the guy. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, it's kind of a running joke, but it's, it's a fact that he was the very first guy who interests me uh, because of his sound and because of his approach to the instrument. So that's how I became more inclined to play the saxophone. Sure. And just tell us some about those early years and sort of coming up and the work that you put in, because I think sometimes that may get taken for granted that it really takes time. You started off at a very young age to really hone your skill and then ultimately define your sound. Very true. Uh, it is work, but it's something about it being more passion than work that allows it not to feel like work. So as I was coming through my musical upbringing, um, even in elementary school, I played in a little uh, concert band uh, with my friends. And, you know, because I was playing with my friends and we all loved music together, that was kind of like a catalyst for more interest in music. 
And through junior high school and high school, I played in jazz bands and concert bands and um, high school marching band. And then we went on to uh, college and I was introduced to Cannonball Adderley's music. Yes. And so if I had to describe my sound, it's kind of a marriage between Maceo Parker and Cannonball Adderley and with a few sprinkles of, of my own stuff in there, you know. <laughs> Um, what would you define as that big breaker? Because I know there have been some really defining moments that we'll get to, but where you really felt like, gosh, I, I, I really could make this a career and, and, and I think this is, I'm on my way. Well, um, I have to step back a little bit and discuss the discussion with my father. Mm -hmm. um, out of high school, I just wanted to play horn. I, I wasn't even honestly really interested in college. I just wanted to get out there and do the on the job training, play, you know, in, you know, on somebody's tour, go on the road, that whole thing. And my father said, uh, yeah, you can do that, but you're going to get that college degree first. Okay. So that's the deal that we made. I went and got my bachelor's in, uh, in business management and I minored in music performance. And so after that, um, music didn't really happen vocationally for me. I, I worked at Woolworth's department store for about eight months as an assistant manager trainee. And the boss, Mrs. Hutchins, loved my voice for some reason. And she had me to do all of the store announcements. So when you came into Woolworth's department store, you would hear me say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have four ply polyester wind tuck yarn for 99 cents. Oh, you know, I so was that yeah. guy. <laughs> right. And I probably worked in the commission on the <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So uh, that was a job that I had for about eight months. And suddenly I got a call from Patrice Russian, who I went to high school with. Uh, she was two years ahead of me. But um, at that point, she had a big hit called Forgive Me Nots, which I did the tenor sax solo on. And a lot of people don't know. Um, and it was time for her to go on tour and she called and she said, Gerald, you know, I'm putting the band together to go on a, a tour and I, I want you to be a part of it. And I'm like, absolutely. But now I have to give two weeks notice to my, uh, my boss. Right. And so I had a meeting with her and she knew when she hired me that I wasn't going to make a career out of Woolworth. So sitting in her office, you know, I was a little nervous and I said, Mrs. Hutchins, um, I got this call. And she says, don't worry about the two weeks. Right. Go do, go fulfill your passion. And that was the end of Woolworths. And, and to answer your question, Patrice Russian was the first um, major experience on the road that I had uh, right out of uh, college and post Woolworths. <laughs> and how did that feel? Because I, as many have said before me, that is an amazing type of first opportunity um, right. to uh, be on the road with such an illustrious artist and things like that. Um, just talk to us about sort of some of those experiences and what you were seeing, hearing, and, and, and learning now, really sort of doing it for real. Well, it was, it was great for me because <clears throat> it wasn't like I didn't know my employer at the time. I went to high school with her. We played in different ensembles together. So it was like going on the road with family, literally. And a lot of the members of her band at that time were dear close friends of mine and most of them are still doing great within the music industry guys like freddie washington on bass uh who's currently out with shania twain and he tours with he toured with michael jackson and a whole lot of other folks but um he's one of my dear friends and we all still stay in touch uh decades later um so but it was in terms of what I had to do, the job description, it was it was very new to me because not only did I have to play the saxophone and memorize all the parts of the show, but we had to incorporate dance steps. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we're in show mode now. So, uh, and I'm not the greatest dancer in the world, my wife will tell you. And uh, so they brought in a choreographer to teach us how to, to dance and play at the same time, which is, if you're thinking about music and dancing at the same time, that's like, okay, what side of the brain is thinking about what? Right. And, right. Uh, but we worked it out through repetition and it was great experience for me. And uh, uh, that particular tour led on to other tours with like Whitney Houston and, and Phil Collins and 
<clears throat> Anita Baker and folks like that. Sure. Um, and before we get into all the big names, um, tell us a little bit about the base, though, sort of how you uh, started incorporating that, because if I understand correctly, now sometimes you'll do a little bit on keys in terms of maybe getting some of the, the harmonics, but then also sometimes switch to bass. And then obviously the sax is your your main instrument of love. Absolutely. Well, bass, I truly love. It's it's uh, a big part of my arsenal in terms of uh, the, the instruments that I'm very passionate about. Um, bass came along in college. Um, I went to see the Brothers Johnson yes. um, back in the day. One of my favorite all-time bassists is Lewis Johnson. Yes. And uh, I was front row center. It was at uh, the Orange Show, which was in San Bernardino, California. I'm, I'm looking at it so vividly now. Right. And all of a sudden, Lewis steps out center stage and he plays this incredible bass solo and then my mouth drops and I'm like I want to do that mm -hmm. and so long story short I borrowed a bass from a, a dear friend of mine uh John Jorgerson who uh pretty much was an instrument collector wow. and I literally sat in my dorm room and and taught myself how to play bass when I wasn't studying right. and so that's how the bass came about and then I started doing little gigs around the college area and for extra money and things like that and you know, years later, uh, people are starting to call me uh, for recording sessions. And uh, so it's it's been a fun experience. It's, it's a nice chapter of my life. No, absolutely. Talk to us a little bit about sort of uh, composition and how that sort of came to be, because that's a whole nother level um, of instrumentation and musicality um, that certainly um, at that time really uh, we would love to know sort of like where that came from and, and how that inner expression of your, your gift um, developed. I was very fortunate enough to have some great music teachers in high school, uh, namely Frank Harris and Don Dustin. Um, and they were like really father figures. You know, I had a great father and I would never call somebody else my dad, but they, they sure. kind of they kind of evolved as father figures because I would talk to him about scholastic things, non-scholastic things, just life, whatever. And uh, one of the things that they always told me is that uh, if you decide to pursue music, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm. Don't just rely on playing the saxophone. You know, you want to learn different instruments. You want to be able to write music, arrange music, whatever needs to be uh, done at the time because you never know what you're going to get called for. So uh, Lock High School, where I attended, uh, along once again with uh, Patrice Russian, uh, was a great breeding ground for wonderful musicians. A lot of the people who came through that institution are doing incredibly well these days. Um, and so those teachings really guided me in the direction of wanting to learn how to write and arrange and produce songs. Um, I've always had this dream that I had, I would have my own band on stage performing music that I wrote and produced. And here we are, you know, and, and uh, 30 plus years later. And um, I just, I love the process of creating music um, and the non-patternistic way that it happens. I mean, like you mentioned earlier, it could be a, a chord on the piano. It could be a bass lick. It could be a saxophone melody. I could be driving down the road and I see a billboard with a catchy phrase and I go, hmm, I can make something out of that. Right. And uh, that's the way I write. I never just say, okay, I'm going to start with this instrument and then I'm going to use that instrument like I did last time. It's kind of a puzzle that you just kind of build and evolve. And it's, it's a beautiful puzzle that I'm still trying to figure out after all these years and, and 21 projects later. Um, I just finished my new EP, which is coming out in late April, and I'm very, very proud of that. And just today, you should know, and I'm very proud of this, I'm bragging a little bit. Oh, please do. I love uh, it. I just, I just found out that uh, my current single called Crazy went number one on Billboard. Yeah, that's right. I saw it when it was number two. I was watching it. Yeah. It, as of today, I found out it's number one, and I have a three-song EP. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time in my career that I've had all the songs on a project go number one. Right. Awesome. So we have a clean sweep on this project and I'm just so elated. It's just been a beautiful day and, yeah. 
And to top it off with being able to uh, do the interview with you, it's it's like the icing on the cake. Thank you. Oh, well, that's a good segue into another um, point when you were mentioning projects. You've worked with so many uh, legends. I wanted to just have you share maybe just a couple of stories of a couple of people you look up to, which could include Maceo, of course. I know you've gotten a chance to work with him. Um, do you really felt like, wow, this was uh, an enlightening moment that, that I grew from or I learned something from uh, a particular artist, if you feel comfortable mentioning the name? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm very proud of my time with Quincy Jones. Uh, I was very fortunate to do two feature songs on his Back on the Block album some years ago, which was, uh, God, it, it's, there, there are projects that just are timeless. They just, just stay with you no matter what's changing around them. And, you know, the Back on the Block project for Quincy is just one of those, those staples that you always refer back to. Right. And uh, I, I performed on two songs, one called September and the other was called Tomorrow uh, with Tevin Campbell. Yes. Uh, September would take six. And um, during those recording sessions, I got a chance to really sit down with Quincy, who is another father figure, you know, just very approachable, you know, very patient. You know, he has a lot of people who come to him because he's that guy. Yes. And one of his biggest talents is bringing icons together to do these wonderful projects. And we just sat on the couch one day and I was at a point in my career where I was kind of at a crossroads and I needed to have some guidance. And he, I just remember the conversation that he, he had with me. And it was a very simple, very brief conversation, but it was action packed. And um, it just set me in another direction and gave me faith and more determination to go in another direction. So uh, I was very happy about that. So Quincy's, Quincy's one of the guys uh, touring with Phil Collins was a chapter for me because that's pretty much the bigger, biggest tour I've ever been on. Uh, we would have outdoor concerts over in Europe where there would be literally 80 to 85,000 people standing solid side by side. You could even see the back of the audience. And I'd be in the horn section looking at Phil and I'm saying in my mind, all of these people are coming to see one guy. <laughs> you know, that's power right there, you know, so, uh, but the way he put together shows, uh, his passion, his, his determination to be like Dionne Warwick, a, a perfectionist, uh, was, was second to none. And we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed until we got it right. Um, great experiences and another platform where I had to play horn and dance. Mm. You know, and his was more action packed than Patrice Russian's. So, I mean, it was like high cardio no. <laughs> with, his, <laughs> with his show and two hour concerts, you know. So, uh, but it was a great experience, you know. It was a wonderful chapter. Absolutely. And then juxtaposed on the other side, and again, if we can't say names, that's totally fine, but where you felt like, you know, I'm seeing something here and I don't want to repeat that, or I don't think I can really be part of that, or this is something that probably isn't uh, the best way to put together a show or to be on the road. Yeah, um, I can't mention the name, but um, there was one tour that I almost gave up on, almost walked off of, uh, because uh, at certain points of the tour, there was a level of disrespect, not only to me, but to the other musicians. And uh, it's one thing to make money um, and, you know, you, you have to pay the bills, but there's another thing when your dignity is, um, is challenged. And it was one of those cases where it was it was a good platform to be on for exposure right. but um this particular uh employer we never knew how they were going to show up you know it was kind of a it felt like a bipolar thing you know sometimes it was nice and, and everything was wonderful and then the next day it'd be like okay is this the same person right. you know so um so yeah, not mentioning the name, I, I, I could have bypassed the emotional side of that particular tour, uh, but uh, I benefited a lot from it. So there were more pros than cons 
And I just look at it in that positive way where it was an experience that I had to kind of purge through, but the aftermath of events that happened enlightened my career in a lot of ways and um, changed my life actually. Sure. And that's why I wanted to go there was to sort of now make this nice transition into who you are and the type of performance and also just sort of that inner peace that you exude because this is a tremendous challenge. This is a career that can be filled with ups and downs, highs and lows, rejections, and yet, you know, incredible accolades all in a very short period of time. And we often see that that can really kind of literally get at the heart of a person and sometimes, you know, ultimately take their life. Um, you've been able to uh, really achieve these great highs and still be able to deal with some of those negatives while remaining positive. Where do you think some of that comes from and what are your, some of your sort of inner secrets if you can give us a couple as to how you maintain that even keel despite the pressures and the demands? Yeah, um, great question. And I would have to say initially, I have to rewind tape to my parents. My parents were uh, very, very uh, important in my life, both of them. Um, I was a, I was a mama's boy and a daddy's boy. I was like split down the middle. You know, there was not, it was 50-50. Sure. And I got just as much uh, knowledge from mom as I did dad and vice versa. And I'm a, a perfect blend of them. And as I'm now older, I'll say things or I'll do mannerisms and my family will say, now, you know, you know, your, that was your daddy. <laughs> <laughs> or you know that was mom right. and it's in my dna so i have to start there uh after that i have to say that my current rock glennis my wife uh who we this year will be celebrating 50 years of being together uh we started out in junior high school so she's seen every chapter of my musical upbringing my personal upbringing the highs and lows and you know we're still here uh, uh, 49 plus years uh, to date and um, uh, she really exudes a sense of balance for me um, and somebody who I can talk to. So when, when you see this piece in, in my aura, it's uh, greatly because of her and because of my parents. And I think as we get older, and more established in your life, you, you tend to have a better radar for discernment, what what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And it's just like, you know, off and on, you know. Uh, so I'm very, I'm more decisive than I've ever been about decision making. You know, I, I get some great calls sometimes for work and, and I'll go, yeah, that sounds good, but what will I have to sacrifice to do that? Right. And and a lot of times the answer is no to participate in those things. So it's it's more about quality of life now. Sure. And um, and I, I'm just living my best life now, and it, it's it's been a wonderful journey. And I, I have a wonderful grandson uh, on top of that that's uh, soon to be two years old. And so everything is cool. I I have nothing to complain about. Sure. What advice might you give? if it's even possible to a younger Gerald, uh, now sort of being able to look back, if you could sort of say, you know, lessons to myself when I was younger, is there any uh, temperament, uh, exuberance, uh, tenor or approach um, that you might say, hey, here's just, here's a piece of advice that maybe when I was younger oh, could have come in handy that I didn't realize, but I learned it and I've mastered it now. Well, the, the first thing that comes to mind, great question again, um, uh, if I were speaking to the younger Gerald, I would say uh, pay more attention to control of your career. When I was younger, I just, as I said before, I wanted to play. I just wanted to get out there and break a sweat, playing my horn and having the people scream and holler, da 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 da. da. Um, but I didn't pay much attention to the business side of it. Uh, I had um, I had managers, I had entertainment lawyers, I had uh, talent agents uh, who along the way took a lot of money from me, not took, but I mean, through their commissions and through their work, um, you know, I had to pay them for those. If I had that money today, uh, I'd be quite a rich man, you know. But um, I would just say ownership 
of your music, of your brand. Um, that just mainly take control of your career more. I think um, the best move that I made in 2016 was to start my independent record company, Bright Music Records. And, um, you know, it was, it was a step out on faith. It was scary to do, yeah. but it's something that I had planned and I had saved up money to have enough capital to go from having a record deal with a big major label to having my own. And it's, it's the best move I've ever made. Um, I've always been my own boss, but now I'm my own boss that owns uh, my, my licensing, my masters. You know, if somebody wants to use my music in a movie, they talk to me, right. you know, and it's, it's just a whole nother thing. And that also creates a legacy for my kids and my grandkids. And, and, and so um, generational wealth is really important to me now. Um, and I would tell that younger Gerald, I would pull him aside and say, hey, man, <laughs> listen to me. Uh, <laughs> this is the road you need to go down. Yeah. But that being said, uh, I'm glad I went through those chapters of learning and making mistakes because it made me a stronger and, and more wise person uh, that I am today. And uh, again, I, I'm just very blessed, you know, to to still be in my mid 60s and, and people still uh, are witnessing my music as number one records and, and I'm still creating and still touring and, and it's just even in the midst of COVID, it's just a blessing to be able to do it, you know. Absolutely. And you talked about uh, sort of generational wealth. I want to just talk and give a shameless plug to your daughter, who's also in the business. And and maybe if you're able to share a, a private conversation or, or a piece of advice, uh, maybe at this point you kind of maybe give your opinions uh, internal, but but something that you might have shared with her or that you you see her doing that you're like, that's a that's a good that's a good approach. Well, several years ago, um, and Selena's like her mom is they're like twins in terms of personality and, and just, you know, just that take charge type of approach to life. Um, I was in Dallas, Texas. Um, just kind of relaxing in my hotel room. And she happened to be in Dallas at the time, visiting some friends. And out of the blue, she calls and she said, Dad, can I come over to the hotel? I'd like to talk to you about something. Well, absolutely, come on over. So about an hour later, get a knock on the door. And I open the door and she has a clipboard in her hand and looking real official, <laughs> like, okay. So she sits down on the couch and she says, well, dad, you know, uh, I love to sing. I love music. I love writing. And, and uh, I'd like to try to take a stab at being a recording artist and, and being a songwriter, you know? And we, we have two kids, my daughter, Selena, and my son is Brandon. He's a videographer. Uh, we as parents never really pushed our kids into one direction. We just said, okay, we're going to, you know, pay for the, the best institution to to make sure that you refine whatever you're interested in and you go for it, you know? And so we never gave them that pressure of, you need to be a doctor, you need to be a lawyer or whatever. You know, it's just like, whatever your passion is, go for it as long as it's positive. And so she's saying to me, okay, I wanna, I wanna be a part of the music business. And my reaction to her was, okay, let's go. Let's roll up our seeds and get to work. And we started doing demos and writing songs together. And uh, on my 1998 uh, Live to Love project, um, that was one of her first major recording sessions. She did all the backgrounds of about five songs in that project. And if you go back and listen to it, it's a very young sounding Selena, but she sounds very professional, in tune, all of her inflections are perfect. And um, to hear her now uh, on stage and to be able to share the stage with her, the whole father daughter thing is just like a, a wonderful celebration, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, she's just evolved to the point where now if I need background vocals on a particular song or a lead vocal, I just give her the song. I'll just email her the song and say, no instruction, you just do you. Right. And what comes back is this, this choir, you know, this, this wonderful uh, melodic 
a perfect presentation of exactly what my vision was was looking at at the time. So I'm very proud of both of my kids. Um, and uh, my son actually does some of my videos, does a lot of my wife's videos for her company, uh, GlennisesKitchen.com. And, and he's uh, he did my very first uh, um, uh, CD cover of my new company. And so, you know, it's a family type of thing. And I just love that. You know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to be proud of. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I know they are as well. Um, our show is called Music and Medicine, and there's so many points I could touch on. I want to start with one that you were hinting at in terms of uh, uh, dancing. Yeah. I know you do power walking. Let's just talk about how you got into that and, and how good that is, you know, for the heart. Yeah, um, I'm a nature boy anyway, and I'm very fortunate to have brought the family here to Colorado in 2005. And of course, if you've ever been here, there's no shortage of scenery and there's no shortage of wildlife and, and just great weather most of the time until, you know, it decides to snow. But um, uh, one of the things I like to do is walk the neighborhood and just breathe the air. And, you know, we live in a, uh, a place that has a lot of pine trees and just a lot of, you know, very nature oriented scenery. And I usually go for an hour walk and I have this one route that uh, incorporates hills and, and other challenges and, and I'll have my headphones on uh, listening to different types of music. And before I know it, I've done an hour's worth of cardio and I just, I just love it. And I'm not one of those guys, I'm not trying to be Charles Atlas and get all the big muscles and everything. I'm just trying to pump the heart, keep it circulating the blood and and uh, keep my mind clear and free and, and that type of thing. So power walks uh, are very, very important to me. And, yeah. uh, and, and when it's too cold outside, I'll, I'll jump on the elliptical machine. Sure. No, we love hearing it because that's the thing. I love when people and my patients sort of customize it to what works for them. I'm always trying to tell patients, take my suggestions and put them in a box and just use it as a color to come up with your, your palette of what will work for you. What do you like? Do you like listening to music while you exercise? There's so many different types of ways, but I like it to be natural. And uh, like I said, being out in nature, what a great inspiration. Um, yeah. And then COVID comes along and you take it upon yourself because I think a lot of times people think like, oh, you know, he's got money for days and it's no problem. You know, he'll be able to cover everybody and, and that's just not possible. So you came up with the idea of doing fundraisers for the band members, not even really like worrying about yourself and how you might manage because right. everybody wasn't working. Um, just tell me where that idea came from and, and sort of how it kind of really felt good to not only give back, but but trying to have the band members realize that same thing too, trying to prepare for tomorrow is really important because it's so hard to know. Well, uh, it was very easy for me to do it because number one, I love my extended family, which is my band. And I have even more extended family, uh, other musicians that I've come across that I truly admire, not only for their talent, but also for their persona and their spirit. And uh, when, when COVID hit us like a brick, um, I went back and remembered the struggling days of me trying to work the clubs in Los Angeles and, you know, getting to the 25th of the month and rent is due on the first of next month. And it's like, okay, I'm 500 short. What am I going to do? Um, so with that in mind, I decided to, from my house, my, my studio in my house, to do uh, a series of three or four live streams uh, the summer of 2020 and uh, through the platforms of Cash App and PayPal, we decided to ask people to donate money for uh, the Musicians Fund. And uh, I would flip that money right around and just unannounced send, you know, my band members and other friends, whatever I had that came from those supporters and they were very, very glad. And I can't tell you how great that made me feel um, because a lot of the feedback that I, I got from that was just very positive. And you know, us as men, we have a lot of pride, man. We don't like to, we don't like to emote when we're hurting, you know, or when something needs to happen in an urgent way. It's like, no, I got this, man. I, sometimes we need that help, man. And so, my mission was to break through that pride and say, hey, look, take this, 
buy some groceries for your kids, you know, pay that utility bill, rent, whatever you need to do. Uh, this is not a loan. This is a gift. We're paying it forward. And man, I, I tell you, it made me feel so good. So um, I hope that COVID doesn't bring us back to that. I mean, obviously more people are vaccinated now, uh, but even the, the, the top of the year kind of feels like, uh oh, here we are with the Omicron variant now, here we go again, you know? And, and for me personally, shows are not like they did before, but they're slowly starting to cancel or be postponed. And it's kind of a hybrid of what happened two years ago. And I'm like, let's not go here again, you know? So, um, so to answer your question, uh, that's why I did the live streams and, and, and it was a little different for me. You know, I'm used to playing to a multitude of people and that, and that's been reduced to a computer. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm staring at a computer now. So the first live stream show was very different for me. It's like, okay, yeah, I don't have that audience feedback. So how do I keep the flow going? You know, but, but you know, if, if you dive into the pool, you got to learn how to swim and, and, and that's what we did. It, it turned out to be a very successful chapter. Sure. I promise this will be uh, the next last question, but I wanted to go into this area because you opened this door and I didn't miss it. Um, 50 years of marriage, are men not wanting to emote? Mm -hmm. Tell us just maybe just, just a couple of the pearls, the good and the bad about really staying that tide and staying the course, the benefits of really having, like you said, a partner for life, but yeah. also just the challenges that exist on the real that really somebody can take away and say, you know, I, I need to be willing to dig deep. I need to be willing to apologize. I need to be willing to say, I'm sorry. Just some of those pearls that really kind of help relationships because so often I see that with my men and my patients, you know, they so need a situation that they're so many times running away from, which is commitment. Exactly. Well, we're a unique case because we started so early. We started in the ninth grade in, in junior high school. They call it middle school now. And um, so we were friends first. And we took our time and we really grew up together. Uh, but I think the, the first thing that has to happen is you have to have the right mate. You know, uh, and sometimes it's not a cosmetic thing. You know, if, you know, when I was growing up, you know, the finest girl in the school, you know, I want her. It, that's not the way it goes. You know, for me, I, I guess rewinding tape to my life back in junior high school, I guess I was a bit of an old soul. So I, I look past uh, a lot of things that guys prioritize. Um, now I have a very beautiful wife and, uh, but more so than that, her spirit really connected with me. Her, um, her caring nature really con uh, connected with me. And this was early on. I mean, by high school, we had already named our kids. I mean, it was that kind of thing. You know, we were planning, man. <laughs> so uh, it just worked now. That being said, it, it was not an Ozzy and Harriet type of situation where everything was hunky dory every day. Uh, we did have our peaks and valleys in our relationship. Uh, a couple of times we had to back away and go in our own respective corners. Um, but we communicated through that process. We compromised through that process. And I had determined that she uh, was and is the best mate for me. And she represents me well. She gave me two beautiful children. She has always been in my corner. She has never failed me. You know, she has never gone left when she should have gone right. She's always been right there by my side. And uh, I just feel so blessed so many years later uh, with the relationship that we have, because as we get older, you learn to love people that you, you really are, that are really part of your life. You, you learn to love them in a different way all the other ways are still in there, but then we're both evolving, both collectively and separately. So I'll look at Glenna sometimes and I'll go, wow, I, I love that new vibe of you now. You know, it just, it just kind of evolves and it just gains momentum. Absolutely. And it's just a beautiful thing. And, and now that we've, you know, uh, we, we got grown kids now and even a, a grandchild and, and another one on the way, 
Um, we just feel so content and we just thank God every morning. We, we have a particular place in our house where we pray and I'll look out the window and just thank God for everything that he's given me personally and my family and um, uh, thank God to date nobody has gotten COVID. You know, we've fortunately bypassed that. And so it's, it's just been a beautiful experience. And I know there's a lot of people who can't emote this type of story. And, uh, but I, I think to answer your question, um, you gotta have the right mate first, and then you gotta be able to come to the table even when it hurts. Even when it hurts to talk about certain subjects, you gotta, you gotta purge through it and say, hey, if I mean much that much to you and you mean that much to me, we got to go through this. And we've had some chapters of that and here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Where can we find more of the love, more of you and um, and follow uh, this just meteoric rise? It's just been so fabulous. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I'm uh, very easy to find. I mean, my website is uh, www.geraldalbright.com. Uh, I have a store there where you can buy autographed CDs. I'm very interactive on all the social media platforms. I just uh, made an announcement that, I, I mean, I've been on TikTok for a while, but I made an announcement that we're gonna take it up a few notches this year. So Instagram, uh, TikTok, Facebook, all the platforms, everything's centralized right there in my, my, uh, my website, so they can go there. Sure. And I just want to thank you for that. It's always been sort of a highlight of interacting with you at your shows. You are always engaging with the audience and signing autographs and sending out CDs that are signed and things like that. And I think that's so important that we sort of not lose that because I think the more distant, especially when people come out to the shows and things of that nature, that connection is really um, something that you've always been so good at, at bringing us. And, um, and we so appreciate that because then you really sort of feel that you've connected with the artists and not just, okay, boom, the show's over there, gone, and that's that. And um, uh, we appreciate you always being willing to kind of go that extra mile. Well, it's my pleasure, and it's it's very comfortable for me to do that. Um, honestly, with COVID in the equation now, we have to kind of massage it and finesse it a little differently. But uh, I love my audience, and I never take it for granted. Um, uh, them coming, dressing up, and paying money to come see me and, and spend the time with me. Uh, you know, they could be doing something totally different. So uh, I'm, I'm always honored and always appreciative when people show up to hear my music. Thank you. And we're so grateful and appreciative for your time uh, with everything that's going on uh, for you to give us time and consideration is certainly a blessing to us. And um, thank you. And we wanted to sort of be one of the early people to say um, happy anniversary and blessings on a productive year. And we all hope that this COVID variant will sort of be the last and put the rest very soon. So uh, everybody- well, Thank you so very much. I thoroughly enjoyed everything and, and thank you for what you do. I mean, uh, you know, as a doctor, you're helping people on a daily basis. I'm sure you have some incredible stories that hopefully we'll get a chance to break bread and, and find out about. So I look forward to that. Sure. Thanks again. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. 